Hello everyone. Um, if the people online can just let us know if you can't hear me um, so that we can change the um, audio settings before our two really important speakers. Thank you very much for coming to this uh, very interesting topic. Um, I'd just like to acknowledge the um, that we meet on the lands of the Ngunnawal people and pay my respects to elders past and present. Let me just take this opportunity to say that um, we are gifted with an opportunity to listen without prejudice and um, response even to the voices of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and to engage with each other in meaningful conversations about what consultation with Indigenous peoples really means. Um, and I hope that we take that um, opportunity seriously as we move towards a referendum later next month. I'm Sonia Palmier. I'm the head of the Department of Pacific Affairs. I'm very happy to welcome our two prestigious speakers this afternoon, Dr. Dr. Nicholas Hoare and Dr. Teresa Mechie. Dr. Mechie? Um, Teresa is a research fellow at the Department of Pacific Affairs. Teresa's doctorate, which was passed without corrections, um, was on the political campaigns of women in Papua New Guinea. Teresa has a wicked sense of humour and she's also very, very persistent. I know that because she eventually made me make her tiramisu after many, many months of <laughs> discussion. <laughs> Nicholas Hoare is a research fellow and he's a lecturer also at the Department of Pacific Affairs. His teaching and uh, research focuses on Australia's historical connections to the Pacific, including PNG. I didn't know, Nicholas, that you worked for the Australian Dictionary of Biography. Good to know. Nicholas has really won us all over in the department with his wonderfully respectful and pleasant personality. Uh, I welcome them both to the stage. Um, thank you very much, Sonia. That was a brilliant uh, introduction. Uh, I didn't expect anything less. Um, and thank you, everybody, for coming to this seminar today. I was just talking to Nick beforehand. It is a beautiful day outside, and um, so I appreciate turn that you've turned up. Um, thanks also to Hannah um, and Jesse for setting up this um, event. I think this could be your first time you've done it without Tanuj, and it seems to be working so far, so thank you. Um, and we too want to acknowledge uh, the unceded lands on which we are speaking um, on today, and we pay our respects to the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples. So um, we're going to try to pull this off today. I think we can do it. We've done it before. Me and Theresa will be speaking. Um, we'll interchange a little bit. It's easier when we don't have to use the microphone, but if there is a problem with um, uh, our voices, please just put up your hand. Um, so we were in this lecture theater in April where we gave a version of this paper. We debuted this work. Uh, this was at the Australian Association for Pacific Studies conference. Um, but that was quite rushed and chaotic. I think everything, if, for those of you at that conference, everything was running over time. Um, it was a brilliant conference, but yeah, I think we had to give this paper in about 15 minutes and we completely didn't stick to our scripts. So the plan today is trying to, uh, you know, stick, uh, you know, Teresa's told me at least, please stick to your script this time, uh, Nick. Um, but yeah, that's exactly it. Uh, we're really happy, uh, though, to be given this opportunity to talk for a little bit longer um, and sort of elaborate on what we have been doing over the past few months and what we want to do um, in the next few months or even years. So um, the plan is that both Teresa and I will talk a little bit about what got us into this topic, um, what we've managed to find in our explorations into the history of it in the 1980s. Um, and then if time allows, I think we want to share a bit of a timeline and have a Q&A um, about our plans moving forward, as I just said, but there is a bit of a, a deadline with this whole project because we want um, to release it in time for the 50-year anniversary um, in Papua New Guinea in September 2025. That sound all right? September 16th, this weekend. Yes, this weekend. This will be timed, this, this talk as well. Um, 
So first of all, I've got to explain what, you know, it's a very long title, what the Papua New Guinea Dictionary of Contemporary Biography actually was. Uh, for me, um, Sonia said, I come from a background um, in the School of History over in CAS. Um, that's where the Australian Dictionary of Biography is based. Um, so we're all very conversant with that, with that idea and the idea of dictionary um, of biographies, national dictionary of biographies. I realized um, coming across the cap that that's not necessarily evident for other people. So yeah, that's my background. Um, with, immediately before coming to DPA, I was a research editor with the Australian Dictionary of Biography. This is a national institution that's been based here at the ANU since the 1960s. Um, in this time, they've published over 13,000 um, short biographical entries about Australians, prominent Australians, but also representative Australians. Um, usually they are authored, they're offered by volunteers. These are usually the uh, experts on their subject. Not always, though, I should add, quite recently, you might have noticed that um, uh, an entry for Sir Donald Bradman has been written, um, and that was written by not, none other than... Um, uh, John Howard, uh, the former prime minister. So there's a there's a bit of a politicization in this process as well. Um, so yeah, um, it's really important that these National Dictionary of Biographies, um, usually they operate on this sort of volunteer basis. Um, it's based around working parties, at least the Australian one has these working parties. Each state in Australia has a working party, but there's also a thematic more and more um, recently, they're, they're creating thematic working parties. And one of the ones they created um, before my time uh, is the Oceania Working Party. Um, so that's, I've been research officer and involved with the Oceania Working Party for a long time. That was originally chaired by Bridge Lau. When Bridge Lau re um, retired around 2016, I think, um, Katarina Tiewa took over as the chair. Um, so I've been working with her on sort of including more Pacific Islanders in the Australian Dictionary of Biography. It's interesting, it has its challenges. Um, our conception of Australia is broad. It includes um, the Australian Empire, the Pacific Empire, right? So that's the formal colonies of uh, Papua New Guinea, Nauru, but also, you know, informal empire places, you know, that um, Australia business interests, religious interests, education networks, places like Kiribati, Solomon Islands, Vanuatu, New Caledonia, Fiji, um, and of course, Aotearoa, New Zealand, where I'm from. So we've had some success in including Pacific Islanders into this, um, the Australian Dictionary of Biography. Uh, since I've been involved, people like Hamid Robert, the inaugural president of Nauru, has been included, as well as a lot of these Papua New Guinean founding fathers, you know, people like Sir John Guys, Lebani Watson, so Albert Maori Kiki, so Te Abau, et cetera, et cetera. We've done about sort of about 20 of them in the last few years. Um, as I say, these are kind of the founding fathers, the big names, political figures, and, you know, usually men. Um, so we've been semi-successful, I think, in integrating these types of people into the um, Australian Dictionary of Biography, but we've been a, a, whole, le a whole lot less successful um, integrating ordinary Pacific Islanders. Um, and this is something we'll get to later in the talk. This is something that me and Teresa want to focus on with a Papua New Guinea dictionary of biography, which won't be constrained by um, these weird rules that we have in the Australian dictionary of biography. So I was in doing research uh, for these Papua New Guinean figures that I came across this um, uh, this dictionary of contemporary biography. This was quite fascinating for me. It was an interesting find. Um, we were putting together an ARC proposal to create a standalone um, Pacific Australian dictionary of biography. Um, and then I came across this and suddenly became interested in, you know, um, uh, if we could learn from this project that was in the 1980s. And the main question I had is, you know, I see traces, I see references to this project existing in the 1980s, but I don't see a finished book. Nothing ever happened. No, um, the project is uh, evidently um, not finished. So like all historians presented with this, this, this becomes a challenge for me, right? Um, I want to work out why, um, why it was never finished. 
Fortunately for us here in Canberra, um, what helps us in this process is uh, the fact that here in Canberra are the papers of um, Jim Griffin, James Griffin. Um, and thanks to uh, Helga Griffin, um, who's here with us today, um, me and Teresa have access to these papers at the National Library of Australia. These four, four boxes pretty much full of um, correspondence about the project and um, also a lot of draft entries as well. Um, so that, you know, has helped me and Teresa, we're writing a longer paper about, you know, what went wrong with the original project. So these have been central um, to that. As well as conversations that we had with uh, Helga at her house as well. Thanks, Helga. Um, so yeah, inside it, there's a lot of um, newspaper clippings from things from the times of New Guinea. Um, that was they're all under the banner of this this PNG people of destiny, and so through that we get a uh, a really good sense um, about you know what this project was all about. Uh, this article will be far too small to read, so let me um, uh, read out some of the the quotes here. But they're basically by trying to um, drum up support for the project in 1986. Um, by saying, you know, why do we need something like this? And, and, and I'm asking that question because I remember pitching this project to Colin, um, our colleague Colin, and Colin said, well, why do you need something like this today when there's Wikipedia? Um, it's a good question. And so, um, so I have been thinking about that a little bit, but, you know, uh, this article, for instance, this newspaper article said, you know, there's very little accessible or conveniently published information on Papua New Guinea, uh, Papua New Guinea's leading personalities. What exists can be frustratingly inaccurate and incomplete. And I guess that's what you would say about Wikipedia articles, right? They're quite, they're getting better and better, I know, but they're quite inaccurate and incomplete still. So this article talks about, um, you know, there's a who's who in Oceania reference book. Those who's who's, I think, are the equivalent, the 1980s equivalent of uh, Wikipedia. Um, and there was, they were riddled with errors, um, uh, people were, were um, what have we got here? Yeah, um, people are uh, appearing under the wrong um, name and, and things like that. The other interesting thing about this article is it talks about Pius Wingti. Pius Wingti was a, uh, the prime minister at the time for most of this period um, of, the, of the project. Um, and they were talking about the fact that if more was known about him uh, in the lead up uh, to his election, uh, that would have been a public good, uh, for instance. The article was a call for collaboration. I'm quoting once again, the biographical history of a nation should be written by the widest possible range of people who possess specialist knowledge and insights or have a desire to use their writing skills to contribute to an important work of reference. Andrew Griffin writes this article. Andrew Griffin is no relation to Jim Griffin, but they're the co-editors. They call themselves uh, spare time editors. They were doing this project in their spare time. And if we're wondering what went wrong with the project, I think that's one of the big reasons, right? They were only doing this part time. Um, but they wisely say in this article that they are not able to research all 1,700 entries themselves. This was a call for volunteer authors. So just to put um, some faces to these names, um, this uh, man here is, is, is James Griffin. Um, uh, he was the, the co-editor, really the sort of the, the main driver of this project in the 1980s. Um, and over here we have uh, PNG historian John Waiko. I made this joke last time, but uh, Bill Gamage um, is here in the photo, but this is one of the very few projects I think that he wasn't really involved with uh, in the 1980s. This uh, Lucille, I understand, was John Wyko's uh, first wife or girlfriend. Yeah, sure. And Helga, is this correct? That this is in Livis's Street in 1981? Yes, it is. Well, that's fantastic. Um, a little bit, oh, we'll get to Teresa soon, don't worry. I'm not going to talk forever. But um, a little bit more about Jim Griffin, I think, uh, is what we need to know. He's a fascinating scholar. I've come to learn a lot about him uh, recently through these papers. Um, Therese will tell you I've become a bit um, obsessed with Jim Griffin, I think. Um, he's a really interesting um, scholar that I think was unfairly um, restricted in his uh, era 
because he's one of these people, despite being very, very knowledgeable, uh, a lot more than, than you know, many people, um, he never completed a doctorate, so this might have restricted his career progression at the time. His interests in Papua New Guinea were mainly around Bougainville. Um, he was friends with people like Leo Hannett, uh, Anita's dad, Mel Togolo as well. Um, one of the best pieces he wrote on Bougainville was his very cutting, you know, a biting critique of Douglas Oliver's uh, history book on Bougainville uh, that came out in the 1970s. Um, biography um, was his favorite genre uh, by far. Um, he published uh, many an entry in the Australian Dictionary of Biography and also a full length biographical studies of these Irish Australians, John Wren and the Archbishop Daniel Mannix. Um, he also edited a biographical collection called Papua New Guinea Portraits. Uh, it's an interesting collection, but it's mainly focused on expatriate personalities, people like himself uh, in Papua New Guinea. From what I can tell, John Weika was less hands-on um, and less involved in this project. Uh, he was the chair of the department. Um, he was very, sorry, he was the chair of the, of the project and he was also the chair of the history department at UPNG. Um, he was involved uh, uh, with a lot of um, departmental politics at the time uh, that would often get in the way, I think, of research. Uh, the interesting thing he did do was run an oral history course uh, at UPNG, and Jim Griffin would often turn up to these oral history courses to recruit authors for this project and to encourage students to go out um, and collect uh, stories about their families um, wherever they may be from. So final slide from me before we go over to Teresa, I just want to point out, so in the 1980s, this was mainly based in the, the history department at UPNG, uh, but it was also in collaboration with the library. It was the library that, um, you know, they upheld their side of the bargain. They created the shortlist of uh, biographical, a biographical register, which was full of bibliographic information, really important stuff that the historians were there gonna, then going to take up and write these entries. It was the historians who let the side down by never finishing uh, the task. What the historians did do is they spent a lot of time debating uh, who should be in the, um, in the dictionary, who should be authoring the articles. And um, some of us here are involved with the Australian Dictionary of Biography, and we spend a lot of time debating these sort of things as well. And so part of the process is coming up with these lists uh, categor categorizing people, you know, by, you know, religious figures, business figures, uh, sports people, um, etc. The list goes on. What I found quite interesting about these big long lists is that there is um, a category for women. It comes right at the end. It might just be because it's alphabetical, um, not because it was an afterthought, um, but it is the smallest sort of list. So it was very uh, much dominated, I think, at the time by this idea of, of, of uh, honoring and championing, uh, championing um, Papua New Guinea's founding fathers rather than perhaps in their founding mothers. So this is where I think um, I might bring Teresa in um, to talk about what got her into this project. Thanks, Teresa. Hi, everyone. <clears throat> um, can you hear me? So when Nick asked me last year if I wanted to um, co-author that history paper with them, I saw it as an opportunity to write about women's representation outside of elections and politics. Um, during my PhD, there were three, um, there's some moments that you don't like, like when you're looking for information and you don't find it, it's really annoying. So in 1977, when the three first women got in, um, the late Naharuni, Walia Toklos and Dame Josephine Abaija, there's not a lot of information about um, Walia Toklos, and I was always annoyed about that. Um, there were also during the 70s and 80s, there was a lot of women who stood up at that time and who contested, but there's nothing else written about them except their name and which constituency they stood for. Now that's, that's, that's okay because a lot of winners get attention and publicity, very normal. But for women candidates who put their hand up to contest, the fact that they're wanting to contest means that they're already doing amazing work in the community. So they're nation makers, but you don't get a lot of that story when you're just they're just recording their names and which um, constituency they're from. So that's one of the reasons why I said yes to this, um, to help Nick with this. And also um, before I came here, I worked on this Power Mary project and that was about documenting women's lives um, through film. And it was about six different women. So that's when the, 
and so the parent need to document the stories right now to make history as it's happening and then later it becomes history. So um, that's one of the first things that I worked on. As far as biographies go, we only have a handful for women. So this is in my country, but Alice uh, Wadega is one of them. Then we have A Thousand Colored Dreams by Josephine Abijah and Dame Carol Kitty's A Remarkable Journey. Now she's working on her second one, so hopefully she'll come and finish it so we can have two. And there's this other book called Into Our Views from Interviews. And this is by Ann Turner. It has, I think, five or six women. At that time, they were the first in their fields. So we had the first lawyer, the first woman academic, the first playwright, um, the first woman um, administrator. So these women at that time in 1995, when that book was written, um, they Meg Taylor was ambassador to America and Canada. So since that time until now, she's already progressed in her career. So it's long overdue for a sequel. She told me to write the second part, but I have a lot to do. Um, there's a big disparity between the percentage of male and female in the historical documentation. And as Nick mentioned, there's only I think 10 or 11% of these um, figures are women and 89% are men. Um, so the late Anne Dixon Weichel writes about this and she attributes this lack of documentation to how women were structurally located in PNG's patriarchal society, as well as the structural relocation during the colonial period. So unless women had direct contact with colonialism, uh, when that could happen three ways, either they were serving time in jail or they were domestic servants of colonial officers, or they were married to some people at that time. Other than that, exposed to missionary um, stations and Christian churches, which of course places them in the private domestic space, which won't be documented as much as, as if you're in the formal institutional spaces. So given this type of history and culture of PNG, it's very normal for the tendency for male leadership and achievement to be well documented. And other women who've done many things will, we just forget them because they haven't been documented. Um, during this project, I found a few amazing women. This one is Florence Griffith. She was PNG's first female librarian, national librarian in 1986. But before that, when she enrolled into university, her contemporaries are people like Sir Vincent Erie, the author and statesman, Sir Rabi Namali, Sir Mekere Marauta, Sir Bart Philemon, who they're very popular, but she's not as popular. So her studies were interrupted by marriage and having children. So she did not graduate with that class, but she continued on um, studying and mothering until she got her BA in 1975. And then in 78, she went to the UK for, to study at the School of Librarianship. And she worked in the library until the 1980s. Now, a fun fact is that her brother-in-law is the current vice chancellor of UPNG. We didn't know that until yesterday. And we were talking to Sinclair and did a bit of digging and found that out, which is really great. Um, another woman is Anna Solomon. She was PNG's first national editor of One Talk, the nation's top person newspaper. She also became the first national publisher of One Talk at the Times of PNG and the month, um, the Trade Monthly. Another woman is uh, Iakila, who was born in 1950. Now she was the first woman to host a television program in PNG um, on the New Guinea Television Network. She hosted children's program like Rompa Rom. I don't know what that is. <laughs> the Big Dog and Friends. This is way before Sesame Street. Um, <laughs> So the last time I presented, Devani Pandey told me that she's still alive and living in Brisbane. So we're actually, Nick and I are very fortunate that we could um, talk to Devani and Sinclair and um, Anthony just in the corridor to share and learn from people who've lived through that time and her personal connections to these articles that we're reading about. Um, so I'll let Nick talk about the problems. <laughs> So obviously that, from our vantage point today, where GEDSI principles are very important, that's one of the problems that, there, you know, there's a, a lack of representation of, of, of women, perhaps, and we'll get to this, what we are hoping to do, but it's definitely our aim to have a 50-50 a um, split um, if we're going to revive this project. Uh, this uh, 
I was going to say one of the big problems, as with all research projects, uh, money, you know, uh, there wasn't enough of it, but they did, you know, from time to time get these little boosts. Uh, this is in 1987, an expat businessman, Harold Quinton, uh, donate, donates some money to help uh, move the project along. I think me and Teresa mainly worked out that uh, we think the main problem was that it was far too ambitious um, from the start. Um, we've mentioned this thing, they wanted to produce 1,700 entries in just three to four years uh, with only two part-time workers working on the project. Um, we, we, we made an interesting comparison to New Zealand. New Zealand at the time launched their own dictionary of biography as well. Um, and they had, you know, a much um, less ambitious goal for their, for their volume one. Uh, and that was going to be finished by 1990. I think that was for our 150 year anniversary of New Zealand since 1840. Um, whereas this project started in 1984. Originally, the, um, the deadline was going to be 1986, and it got pushed out to 1987, then to 1988, and then it just fell off the radar altogether around 1989, 1990. So I think real, from the very start, there was this pressure uh, that was hard to keep up. Um, and yeah, all sorts of things. It, it, it came and, and went in waves. The interesting thing, halfway through the project in 1986, Jim Griffin pitches it to uh, uh, Oxford University Press uh, based out of Melbourne. Uh, they like the idea. It becomes the Oxford Dictionary of PNG Biography at that point. But then at that point, it was always uh, meant to be a contemporary project. The idea was to only write about people from the period 1945 and um, after, but uh, something happened, it, it, again, it, it uh, went away from the script, and uh, once Oxford came on, they wanted them to, volume one, to go back to pre-contact days, right up to 1950, and the second series would cover the period after 1950, so that's a pretty uh, tough task as well. I think Teresa's telling me, if we are going to revive this, we will definitely focus on the contemporary uh, period, we won't be going back too far. Um, and so, yeah, all sorts we could say. Andrew Griffin, uh, the co-editor at the start, he leaves in 1986. He leaves Papua New Guinea. Um, uh, and he, you know, he's replaced at the library by Florence Griffin. Uh, something about that last name, Griffin, uh, in Papua New Guinea. None of them are related. Um, and so, yeah, the, the, the timing of the project in, in general is quite interesting, we think. Obviously, it's a, a little awkward for someone like me to say, oh, Perhaps Papua New Guinea wasn't ready for a, a national project of the scale in the 1980s, but um, but Papua New Guinea was dealing with other things. Obviously, in the 1980s, more more pressing sort of um, e uh, economic issues, etc. And then I think what we've come to say is that you know the start of the Bougainville crisis at the end of this decade was probably the um, the final nail of, in the coffin uh, for this project. But yeah, what's motivating us is um, to revive the project. Um, so Teresa mentioned that we are writing a longer article. Uh, we published an in-brief uh, recently, uh, and the longer article should be coming out in this journal here, the Australian Journal of Biography and History, which is an ANU Press publication, open access. Um, here's another photo of Jim. Um, this is a great desktop publication that was put together by um, Helga. So there's a lot of really good information um, in here that we've been drawing from for our larger article. And one of these things that we found, I'll just move this, um, it's not just Jim, you know, not, we can't just concentrate just on Jim. Uh, this man here is um, Sam Keimer, um, who we came across um, in the archival boxes. So around, so he was involved in the project in the 1980s. He wrote a few of these entries. They were published in the Times of New Guinea. Um, in about the year 2000, uh, he writes to Jim. Jim is then living in Canberra, and he says, can I, you know, what about this project we're working on in the 1980s? Can I, do I have your permission to revive it? Uh, Jim was very supportive at that point and said, yes, please, you have my blessing. Uh, Sam Keimer was at the UPNG library where a lot of this biographical database was kept. Um, so he tries his best in the 2000s, early 2000s, to revive the project. Um, he, he, he does a pitch for a bio biography conference uh, here at the ANU, one of those ones run by Bridge Lau every now and then. 
um, and he doesn't he doesn't get accepted. We're not sure exactly why he didn't get accepted. Um, we've seen the paper that he proposed. Um, some other people have said this. Uh, Sam Kyman wasn't the most polished writer going around. Um, so maybe he wasn't accepted for the, uh, the conference because of that, or there could be all sorts of reasons we don't know. Um, I'm just bringing this up because someone who peer reviewed our article wanted us to make more of this, um, this point, you know, in, in the 2000s that, they, that Papua New Guineans try to revive the project, but they don't get very far because, yeah, there's an obstacle in the way. Perhaps it was a visa issue getting to Australia. We're not sure yet. And that's why we want to, um, Teresa was in Papua New Guinea last month, right? Um, trying to track down more information and hopefully we can go over there, the two of us um, next year, a few times. Um, and so, yeah, as I say, there's uh, what's driving this is this, this date, this commemoration date. And this is what drove this project in the first place. The curious date to commemorate, uh, was 1984. They created a centennial committee um, around, you know, creating these national cultural projects um, to, to, I don't know if celebrates the right word, but to mark 100 years. And you see this in, in various different forms. Uh, this is probably the most interesting form, 100 years of colonial intrusion. Uh, 1884 is when the British and the Germans set up their protectorate. Um, elsewhere, you've seen 100 years of modern government, a hundred years of of, um, of of modern Papua New Guinea, even, but um, uh, the people behind the Centennial Committee in 1984, people like John Wyko, were saying, you know, no, no, this is just an opportunity for us to critically interrogate uh, colonial history, um, 100 years on, and so now we're me and Teresa are looking at this date, 2025, as a similar opportunity to interrogate uh, the recent history. Of, of the nation of Papua New Guinea. You want to say a bit more, Teresa? Um, so one of the constraints for the previous project was they couldn't find a lot of local researchers to train. Um, I think there was also an incident where they broke into Jim Griffith's place and stole recorders, like equipment. Um, I guess my point in mentioning that is that at this now in 2023, we've got cloud and recorders and audios and so many tools to help us to do this type of work. And um, in terms of large scale project, we've had experience with um, longer, bigger projects like the election observation where so many people have gone out and skills like interviewing and observing all of that. And through our own network, so many people have come through university and tertiary education, have PhDs and masters that they can help collaborate and um, I don't think we'll run out of looking for people to, to collect um, biographies. Um, this is my look father slide. Um, we recognize that we're entering a space where a lot of people have done work in some form of recording one way or another. And we just like to acknowledge the contemporary work and the ongoing work. For example, PNG Speaks is a website managed by Jonathan Ritchie from Deakin University. This website contains 12 recorded interviews with PNG historical figures, uh, just four women, eight men. Uh, the development policy blog has also published a series of um, farewell or valet blogs that commemorate people who've passed on. The Journal of Pacific History has done that as well. Um, Dr. Rooney at CHL is also doing amazing work with archiving, organizing, and documenting records of her mother, the late Naha Rooney. So these projects, they all work in tandem and we're sort of going for the same purpose, but we're doing different types of work, but we're heading into the same ocean, um, so to speak. And it's not just in PNG. We have colleagues at CHL, uh, particularly Pambu with Annie, Kari, and Deb, who are currently working on updating the index on women in the Pacific from 92 upwards. Um, there, this display is on level two of the Coons building, so you can go check it out. Another colleague, um, Ana Naupa, and her team of Taft Tumas in Vanuatu are doing a similar thing, but it's um, targeted towards younger children and a different audience, but the same idea of um, remembering these people from the past. And also, I learned recently while I was in PNG that the government, um, the Ministry of Tourism, Culture, and Arts are doing this project called Government the Politics Blongumi, 1983. So they're very fixated on that 1983-84 date, but we're going to move up a bit because um, 
that this book it will come out. It has over 1,200 pages. They started working on it in 2020, and they plan to launch it in 2025. Um, so their focus is particularly on colonial leaders, um, nation builders, men at that time, whereas ours, we want to look more holistically because PNG is a hybrid society. We've got traditional leaders. We've got different sectors that are not formal. So we want to spread out that um, that category. And You're right. And, and, and on this, Theresa, um, yeah, I've got to thank um, David, uh, our colleague David Oakshop, for um, uh, reminding us about this literature that we weren't aware about, but in this difference between nation building and nation making, right? So um, nation building being that more sort of formal um, uh, post-colonial state uh, institutions that are very important, you know, um, and in these so-called weak, so-called weak states in Melanesia, there's a big focus, right, on, on, on building up uh, state institutions. But, you know, does that come at the expense of this more ongoing uh, grassroots sort of nation making that obviously will, will, will keep going on um, forever. There's no end date to that. Um, just as, you know, nation building is an ongoing process as well. But I like this quote from Bob Foster, so um, American anthropologist uh, writing in the 90s. He's sort of um, responding to quite a few things, I guess. Benedict Anderson's um, The Nation as a, a um, imagined community or nations as these invented places or a nation as sort of the narratives that people tell themselves. Um, and But the important thing we wanted to uh, point out here is, you know, um, collections of peoples and it's how these collections of peoples try to create or seize these state structures as their own. And that's where we see it sort of chimes quite nicely with biographical writing, right? Focusing on individuals, everyday, ordinary Papua New Guineans, um, rather necessarily than these, yeah, founding fathers or founding mothers. Um, so that's sort of, yeah, our impetus, I think, right, Teresa? Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, that's, I'm not sure if it's not a, um, a thesis proposal review, but we do have a, a bit of a, um, a plan, a, a, a timeline of what we want to do. We, we've already started. Uh, we applied for some funding in, in May. We're still waiting about whether we're going to get that funding or not. Teresa has been out to Vanuatu at NACFest, right? You talked with, who was on your panel? Dame Kara Kadum. Yeah, so she was excited about the project? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's cool. <laughs> Um, and then, and then PN, um, Teresa was at PNG Update, uh, very happy about the MOU that was signed between ANU and UPNG, perhaps, you know, paving the way for this more collaboration. Um, and our in brief was published uh, in, in August as well. Um, the, big, the big part of this project, if we are to get funding, is these two workshops that we plan to do in uh, next year in, at UPNG. One, uh, the first one, you know, a more general sort of workshop, you know, asking the question, what is the nation? Um, two sort of uh, HDR students, uh, early, um, early career researchers, um, and how bi biography might fit in with that. Um, and that might be a way to recruit authors as well, get interest in the project. Then we, uh, the second one will be a bit, little bit more targeted uh, about how we're actually gonna produce these, um, these written entries. Um, and then, yeah, we, we do want to, um, it's not clear, we do want to, um, I don't know, we picked 50, you know, 50 biographical entries for 50 years, uh, that's a manageable amount, uh, a, a spread, not the 50 most prominent people, but just, you know, 50 people, um, and to, to put that together in an edited um, volume to be launched uh, in September 2025. We've got here, uh, after that's done, hand over to UPNG. We do see this as an ongoing um, process, an ongoing uh, National Dictionary of Biography, um, you know, modeled on the Australian Dictionary of Biography with a website um, where, where entries are, are uploaded. And at that point on, on the, with the website, we'd also bring together these new entries we'll be commissioning uh, with all these old entries that um, Jim and his colleagues um, produced in the 1980s, and they can be online as well on this, on this website. If UPNG want, want to take it over, of course. Okay, so this is the last slide. Um, so Sam Pami tried to revive this project a decade ago for the same reasons that we want to revive it. 
In the last few years, a handful of PNG nation makers have lived, who have lived through the transitionary period from pre to post independence have passed away. Um, the three others are quite famous. This young girl on the side, she, her name is Susan Karipe. She's the one that gave a facelift to the PNG flag. Um, initially, it was designed by an Australian um, civic worker. I think his name was Hal Holman. And he drew it with yellow, green, and it looked like the Morabi flag. And then she looked at it and she put the diagonal cross, right, and then separated black and red, and then put the flag and the Southern Cross, and then the Bird of Paradise and the Southern Cross. So that was, um, that's her story. And when she passed away in 2017, I recall PNG Media putting all these articles about airing their grievances that the nation wasn't acknowledging her or doing some kind of, you know, look saga to her work to the nation. So I thought it was important to mention her that she also made the nation in some way. Um, and Rabi Namalia was also on the board of this project in the 80s and Nahal Rooney, our first female minister, she's held multiple ministerial positions with which none has been able to do that up until this stage. So she's very significant. And um, of course, Sir Michael Samaya. Now, why first met, I didn't meet him. I didn't stalk him. Okay, I saw Michael Samaya at Barco Fuld Road Pharmacy and I was a teenager or something. I'm like, oh my goodness, that's Michael Samaya. You know, I could see him and that was amazing for me. And then I realized that many people coming after We'll only learn of these people through books and films and old archival materials that we have to create for them. Um, well, I was privileged to live and you know, see them, glimpses of them time to time, but now they're truly historical figures. So it's, we have to get this um, project moving. Um, a lot of time and effort has also already gone into it. We have, I think, over a thousand entries from the previous project, and they also deserve to see the light of day. Um, so we acknowledge that it is a significant undertaking and the benefits of it are, are really good because they foster also a sense of national identity. And I speak as a Papua New Guinean that we are ethnically very different. There's regionalism, there's all sorts of things that continue to afflict our nation. So we need some sort of national building thing to bring people together to a common identity. And I think this is maybe just a little project and PNG have this way of reflecting every time. So when it comes independence, Hopefully this will be ready, uh, not just this project, but other projects I believe are happening in different spaces will come together and it might be a good time to reflect on 50 years. Um, and for Sol, thank you for listening. Uh, Nick will take your questions. Uh, <laughs> and for Sol, uh, Teresa and Nicholas for an absolutely fabulous presentation and an amazing project. I'm very biased. I think Nicholas knows that I like to hear the, the acronym JEDT. Um, I don't know why you know that, but uh, I do like to hear that acronym and it's really pleasing to hear that um, this project will have a 50-50 split. I think the concept of recognizing um, women's leadership and presenting it as equal in a contemporary biography, um, a dictionary of contemporary biography is really important. We have um, just under 15 minutes for questions. I'm going to ask our two presenters to come back. Um, and uh, yes, hello. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm the Thank you so much. To be invited to be here at all the same. So many thanks. Thank you. Yes, my name is Devan Temu. Uh, thank you. One of the, the two things. There's one thing I picked up in your dates of 1884. It's from that perspective that I want to question why that date. To me, as a Papua New Guinean, the churches, missionaries that came for the London missionaries started in 1871. Mm -hmm. And so people like William Laws, who came out from Newark to Papua New Guinea World, and by 1884, he was already in Port Mosley, and that's when he had the launch of the British to claim Papua. So 1884 cuts out the other important parts. And for me, that's very important because the area that we come from, 
like all the missionary stuff over there, you said we have names that we use in our mother tongue. Like uh, Bearo, we say Bearo, Bearo. And those are very important figures for our part because don't forget the church became independent before the country did. 1975, Hudson, for example, the London Mission Society, which became the United Church of Papua New Guinea and Solomon Islands, was 1964, I think, that became a church. So the, none of the positions were held by Papua New Guineans, and those are very prominent people. But also with the South Sea Island Missionary Spread, example, um, Rotoka's wife, Hungane, she taught the people of Hanovada to sing Herobeta songs. So her record is never there. So we need to, if possible, to include that date so that we seek out information for those. Mm -hmm. So that's the, that, uh, the second part I want to bring to your attention is uh, looking at all those images. They're mostly political figures, well known figures. But there is this important part, which a lot of Papua New Guineans have thought they do, it's the sporting heroes. Mm -hmm. Athletics, for example. So I'll give you an example of um, Yamo Launa. She was a Papua New Guinea athlete, a champion, and has been and still alive, active on Facebook. She posts all these pictures about all her colleagues that were involved in the South Pacific Games and the names as well and the dates they won. So, like, for example, 1968, I was involved in the South Pacific Games as a, an official uh, Ashwabit people to go and take their marks through the 100 dash. And Kathy Yonge, she was Tongan. Now, she won five gold medals in that game for her country, the only woman ever in the history of the South Pacific that won that many gold records for her country. So again, here, record is not there. We need to maybe use the sports personality that one well, because Papua New Guinea and Pacific Islanders relate to these people much more than some of these people that we see in the papers. And that, that's just my thought. I agree totally. Sports women. Yeah, that was one of the funny things about in the 80s, they did have this list, a potential list of sports people, uh, but they got criticism because there's too many rugby league players in, in, in the list. Uh, um, I, um, yeah, Divina, you bring up two really important things there is, uh, uh, yeah, the importance of the church and religion to, to this idea of nation and nation making. So yes, we'll take that. Um, this, the, the athlete you mentioned, and you mentioned she's still alive. So, Teresa, you're very keen for us to only include people who have passed away. Is that correct? But other dictionaries have that. So it's something that we're talking about. Because at that time, they named it contemporary because a lot of them were still alive. And now we've come to the... It's not like we're going to cap it at 50. It's going to continue. But just for this to, to commemorate 50 years, we'll get the ones who've passed on. And But the... The hope is to revive it so other entries will come in and hopefully UPNG in partnership will continue that um, collating biographies and that will come in later. But yeah, I think the idea is that it's meant to be an a, a authoritative record, right? So you, you, if somebody is still alive, you, you, you worry that they'll, they'll do things in the later part of their life, right? And you'll need to update and revise it. Um, but I think that's up, to, up for debate. I think that's the general idea, but yeah. <laughs> well, we'll just take the question um, from our colleague online, Jonathan Ritchie. We might need to unmute, sorry, Jonathan. Unmute me. Hi, Teresa. Hi, Nick. Lovely Hi. to see you both. Oh, Jonathan, Am I still there? sorry. Okay, all right. Can you close this one? This one, this one. Here we go. Try again. Okay. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> yeah. All right. Good. <laughs> Try again. Good to see you both. Looking forward to seeing you both down at Warrnambool uh, uh, in about six weeks' time. It'll be really terrific. Have lots, lots more talk talk about this. It'll be really, really good. Um, 
just a quick one. I'm sorry that this sounds great. Of course, it's really good on you. Wonderful project. Really, really good. And can I say particularly good to see you, Teresa, doing this? Um, no. I'm, and I'm no. saying, yeah. No, no. Sorry, no offense, Nick, but but you know, uh, Teresa, this is a Papua New Guinean project, uh, and that's that's kind of my point. I think that um, this has to be something that comes from and is written by, largely written by Papua New Guineans. I mean, I, I, I. I and we know there's all sorts of challenges because uh, having a, a firm, solid, good institutional base in PNG, and we know the dire state of history universities in PNG. Uh, it's pretty sad. Uh, there's a huge difference between when this initial work was being done back in the 80s and now, because then there were people like, you know, John Waiko, there were people like August Kitchen, there were people like Anne Dixon Waiko, a whole range of other really terrific Papua New Guinean academics. Uh, and, you know, because of all sorts of reasons, which we all we don't need to go into, you know, history and the humanities generally have been, you know, starved oxygen for decades. Um, so I would just say, I mean, it, it's great that you're talking about workshops in UPNG next year. Um, and if there are ways that you've got to you've got to have a really good solid ally, um, either at UPNG or at Divine Word, which could be a possibility, or maybe PAU. Um, I was talking to someone there the other day about, you know, th they don't have a historian, but they're interested in history. So, um, Teresa, I think you should be the new professor of history at P UPNG. That would work a lot. <laughs> <laughs> or something like that. I, I, I mean, I. Ker it's a shame. Kerrid was just gone. Kerrid and, and I ran a, a biography writing workshop at PAU back in, I think it was about 2012 or so. I'm not sure. And we tried to get people from, but well, both well, really mainly UPNG, but there were others as well. And we got some really good people. But of course, you know, you can start something like this. And then it just goes away. I, understandably, the momentum goes and there's all sorts of other pressing concerns and people yeah. move on and and I think having that solid base whether it's at UPNG or whether it's at one of the other universities but it or it could even be I don't know like the NRI I don't know anyway that's my thoughts but it looked good on you it's fantastic I'm really looking forward to uh, further discussion and hopefully we'll uh, continue to uh, collaborate a bit on it nice thank you Jonathan I remember that workshop and at PAU because I was there. Yes, I remember. I got sidetracked with the PhD, but I'm circling back. So yeah, okay. you are. yeah, yeah. I was saying that great. Well, I'll have to yeah. care when has gone because it's, but I'll have to tell her that that it's a it's a I think Willie Huandua was there too. Um and uh, he was I'd love to get Willie more involved. Um but you know but then again Willie's he's so busy, you know it's a trouble. It's you know and then we lose good wonderful people like Anne. You know, it's a, it's a, it becomes a labor of love when um, people have other things to do as well. Well, I think that was, as you've identified, I think that was probably the problem back in the eighties. You know, so I don't mean I, look. I don't mean to sound uh, doom and gloom, but I just think maybe the moment has come. And what you were saying before about there's a lot of organically, you know, you know, what's the word, uh, autochthonously to use a relevant word, um, uh, developing its interest in, in within PNG itself. That's great because that's where we need to develop it further. It's I I, I mean I I'm as guilty as any of us by being the you know the the white man who comes in and says let's do this. You know? um, but it has to be a Papua New Guinean uh, 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 idea. And from what you're selling, it sounds like it is. Thank you, Jonathan. Okay, thank you, Teresa. Thanks. With the, with the final minute that we have, we'll take the question. <laughs> yes. Yeah, no, I, I, I was teaching at UPSG at the same time as Jim, and I can remember all the shenanigans that went on inside the history department, which doesn't make me very optimistic, I say, about the capacity of UPSG to sort of do now what it couldn't do then. But, but I, I'm kind of following up on Devan's question. I'm interested about if you've got limited resources and you can only aim to do so many entries in the next few years, how do you decide who to exclude? So, like, the, you've got contemporary type. Does that mean you would just exclude anybody who was born before Michael Tamari, for example? Uh, do you exclude people who are 
still alive, as it sounds like Theresa wants to do. So you'd exclude Carol Kidding, for example, or ignore Vagi Brashbalan, but we think she's still alive, is she not? Um, and you exclude people like Elton Brash because he was not actually a New Guinean. So you, even if, even if Nora unfortunately was her part of the way, you, would, you could include her, but you wouldn't include Elton, whereas you would include Carol because she's a citizen. Because these are all political decisions, right? So, so I just wondered what sort of mechanism you have in mind for making the political decision about who to include and who to exclude, who to not include, right? either because of age or citizenship or whatever it might be, or the fact they're still alive. So you thought that all that through. <laughs> um, should I speak off my head? Oh, that's not good. Oh, you can, yeah. Okay. Well, sure. <laughs> um, for Elton, I think he, for people that are, I'm looking at those who've never been documented at all. So with, um, I think Mr. Brash, he's in the Australian dictionary. So if some of them are there, then that's okay. And they can come after, but just for this, two-year project, I'm fixated on the ones who've passed on and the ones who aren't politicians necessarily, because we've had enough of politicians, I think. <laughs> That's just me. It's not in, written in stone, but Nick can say something else. Yeah, I, th I think, uh, going back to John's point as well, is really interesting. Uh, at PAU, yeah, there's a really good historian there, Perilla uh, Indrame. And I met her recently, and um, and she's really keen to be involved in this project. She teaches Pacific history there. And I think bringing Teresa on, the whole idea is that we're going to go outside of history, right? We're not, this, there's no reason why political scientists, anthropologists, all these other humanities um, people can't, can't work on this project. We're not limited to just historians. Um, uh, on the, yeah, the question of inclusion and exclusion, um, yeah, that's the good fun of this project, and that's why we, we set up an a advisory board um, to, to have these sort of debates. Um, uh, yeah, back in the, in the 80s, they settled on a, a ratio between three nationals to one uh, expat. Uh, they had a great debate over whether Gough Whitlam should be in the in the UK, in the PNG Dictionary of Biography. Yeah, I, I think we'd probably want it pretty much all um, Papua New Guinean city, citizens. Yeah, um, oh, yeah, that's about all I can say. But yeah, you're right. That's where the fun happens, where you debate over who can be included and excluded, and then I guess with the book reviews, people get angry about who we don't include as well. So yeah, <laughs> thanks, Colin. That's a good question. <laughs> Well, with that, um, very, I, I don't know, I feel like there's a there's a duty of care that's required to make sure that these two are still alive after the two years, um, given all of the politics that's going to be uh, <laughs> involved in deciding these things. Please come up with a good criteria. Yeah. I'm saying to you both. Um, with that, can you please uh, help me in thanking our presenters? And thank you to those who participated online. I hope to see you again. Oh,